Good afternoon. I am Joe Samponia with Sachs Healthcare, and I will be your technical producer for today's webinar. Before I introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Lauren Burkow, and Dr. Nicholas Gravenstein, I would like to show our audience how to send in questions for our speakers during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Our moderator for today's webinar is Dr. Lauren Burkow. Dr. Burkow is a professor of anesthesiology in the Division of Neuroanesthesia at the University of Florida. She focuses on difficult airway management in addition to neuroanesthesia. She has written numerous papers and is a member of many professional societies. In 2015, she was presented the Maryland Hospitals for Healthy Environment Physician for Environmental Health Award. Dr. Burkow, please begin. Thank you, Joe, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is Consistent and Reliable Pulse Oximetry. It really is more than just applying a probe. Speaking today on this very timely topic is an expert and colleague of mine, Dr. Nicholas Gravenstein. Dr. Gravenstein is, a, is the Jerome Modell Professor of Anesthesiology, as well as a Professor of Neurosurgery and Periodontology at the University of Florida. Dr. Gravenstein's work has led to seven patented innovations, including two monitors for carbon dioxide and a non-invasive method for determining hematocrit and blood levels of hemoglobin and oxygen. He has edited and co-edited multiple textbooks, contributed chapters to 28 books, and has written or contributed to more than 80 articles. Oops, sorry. He has the following disclosures. He's a consultant to Phillips Medical as well as a consultant to 410 Medical. Now this continuing education program is approved for one contact hour for nurses and respiratory therapists. Here's our accreditation statement, which you are welcome to read, and support for this educational activity is provided by Phillips. And now I'm gonna turn it over. Whoops, did we, did we lose a slide? No, okay. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gravenstein, who's gonna to talk to you about pulse oximetry. Dr. Gravenstein. Hello, everybody out there, and, and good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, I'm sorry we can't see one another, but this is modern times, and so we're going to do this as a, as a webinar. So we all know about pulse oximetry. We all have our tricks and special problem solving that we use to make it work when we're having trouble. Uh, let me start with uh, reminding you to get your flu shot, all you Game of Thrones fans, because if you do, you are less likely to be on the receiving end of a pulse oximeter, particularly one in the ICU, which is largely what this is about today. So when we talk about pulse oximetry, we, we want to have some learning objectives. And so I want to do the how, where, when, and why, a little bit of clinical situations that make pulse oximetry less reliable. And then lastly, uh, talk a bit about the nasal ALAR pulse oximetry probe for select patients. So if we if we now think about why pulse oximetry, well, it's because we can get the pulse. That's the pulse. We can get the oximetry. That's the SpO2. We can do it non-invasively, continuously, and remarkably accurately. But we also get other information, and that would include heart rhythm. It's a nice way to pick up an irregularly irregular heartbeat in somebody that's not on an electrocardiogram. We can tell if any of our variables are changing. We happen to put it on the same arm as a blood pressure cuff. We can determine a systolic blood pressure via return to flow. Pulse waveform variation gives us some insight into the patient who is hypovolemic uh, and might respond to volume. Pulse oximetry is certainly a sign of life. It even has application during CPR. And it tells us when we've reached an alarm condition because we can enable alarms. So if I, if I now go and talk about the data, see if I can make the data play. There we go. So we all know that sound. And so that is the pitch that is qualitative and correlated with saturation. And I hope this makes you uncomfortable because it makes me uncomfortable when it's going down. And the beauty of the pulse oximeter is these data, if the audio is on, are available without having to look for them. Same thing we can learn about a change in heart rate, a change in saturation without looking at it. Uh, the waveform, obviously, we have to inspect to see. Now, 
pulse oximetry is such a commodity. We've sort of many times don't pay attention to the details that make a difference. And, and I want to simply begin this by saying just because it's easy to use doesn't mean we all know how to use it correctly. Just because there is a number doesn't mean the number is correct. And just because it's still going down doesn't mean you haven't already corrected the underlying problem. And just because it's not working doesn't mean the probe is bad. And I think particularly in the difficult to monitor critically ill patients, it's the, these little details become very relevant and can make us more successful if we have a mental model of how they work. So how does a pulse oximeter work? Well, we see a red light, but there's actually two LEDs. There's a red one that's visible, an infrared one that is invisible. And these things flicker off and on hundreds of times a second, and they then send their signal to a photo detector, which tells how much is coming from the red and how much is coming from the infrared. When a pulse oximeter is properly applied, the light emitting side is directly opposite the photo detector side. This is an opportunity for attention to detail, and it is over the arterialized vascular bed, most commonly at the tip of a finger. Now, the pulse oximeter creates a photoplethysmogram that shows you when the least of these two wavelengths of light is getting through and when the most of these two wavelengths of light is getting through. So you may be familiar with volume plethysmography. So if you take an arm and put it into a graduated cylinder of water and you look at the meniscus of the water, you see the water level will rise in this image on the right when the heart beats during systole, and it will recede a little bit during diastole because you add volume to the arm with each pulse. In the same way, you add volume to the finger with each heartbeat. So your finger actually gets a little bit bigger each time your heart beats and then shrinks back down again during diastole. When your finger is big, less light gets through, so that's the peak of the waveform, the highest absorption. And when your finger gets little during diastole, you have the trough of your plethysmographic waveform, very much like an arterial waveform. Now, what's happening is, is when the finger is the fattest, when the least light is getting through, the computer is computing the ratio of how much red light is getting through from the red LED and how much of the infrared light is getting through from the infrared LED. And then it goes to a lookup table that was generated from a bunch of volunteers who allowed themselves to be desaturated uh, when they did this. So the computer is then looking at a lookup table that looks like this graph I have here and you see at the bottom this ratio of how much red and infrared get, light gets through, you would then see what that ratio is, follow it up to this diagonal line, and then look across, and that would be the saturation. Now, it assumes that you have an adequate signal-to-noise ratio, and if you do, then it will give you a number. Now, when saturation determination is difficult, We've all taken care of patients like this. There are a number of explanations. It could be an inadequate signal. It could be inadequate signal to noise ratio, or it could mean the probe simply isn't optimally positioned. So when we think of a finger, because that's the most common application for pulse oximeter, our fingers um, aren't all the same. They're not all the same color. They're not all the same thickness but there's a certain amount of the finger that doesn't change over time. That's your skin, your tissue, your bones, your ligaments, uh, the venous blood, and some arterial blood. There's a small fraction of the finger that changes with each heartbeat. That's the pulsatile component. And this time-varying component is what is used to generate the uh, signal and the timing for the pulse oximeter. So of the total absorption, the pulsatile part is only about 2%. So that if you have a monitor that uh, allows you to display a perfusion index or a signal strength, that's what the two is. It's the size of the signal. Most of the signal is simply absorbed uh, 
by the tissue in the finger. So first question or first comment, mental model. We know that we would get the same number from any finger. But what we are interested in is, is what's the last finger to fail in somebody who's sick? In other words, is there a finger that gives a bigger signal than other fingers? And the answer to that is yes. Generally, it is the long finger, uh, easy to remember as the bird finger, maybe not politically correct, but the long finger gives you a substantially larger signal than any of the other fingers. So it makes good practice to, as a default, when you ask someone to put on a pulse oximeter probe or you place one yourself, to simply ask, ask it be done or do it on the long finger and stay away from the thumb and from the little finger. Uh, most people who've looked at this find that the ring finger is a close second, so it's not wrong to do that. It's simply that if you have a patient doing poorly, the long finger is the last one to fail because it has the biggest signal. Here's an example using a reusable probe of the perfusion index on a little finger. You see bottom right-hand corner, it's 4.3. Here it is seconds later put on the long finger and you see it's 5.5. That's a 20% larger signal. That's simply less likely to fail on you. So that's a, that's a nice thing to be aware of if you don't already know it. Um, you can get erroneous data from a pulse oximeter. Uh, that can come from motion. Uh, you get some sort of a distorted or poor waveform. You should be suspicious anytime the heart rate from an electrocardiogram and the heart rate from the pulse oximeter aren't within a couple of one another. That is suspicious for noise. So let's take a peek at this and talk about why motion artifact almost always makes the pulse oximeter go down. So if you imagine a normal signal on the left-hand side of this, you get a nice regular waveform. You have a certain amount of light getting through it systole, uh, a little bit more light getting through in diastole, you make a waveform. If you introduce motion artifact, the light coming through becomes more random. And when it becomes random, you get about the same amount of light coming through on, when the infrared LED is illuminated is when the red LED is illuminated. So you drive the ratio between the red and infrared transmission or absorption to one. What does that mean? That means on this table, if you look at the bottom, you see one, you follow the red dotted line up to where it intersects, look across, say that's a set of 85%. So most motion artifact drives you towards 85% because most patients are already at a saturation higher than that. It will make the pulse oximeter read lower. That's why you look at the waveform because motion artifact is discernible by a waveform that has artifact in it and doesn't look like an art line waveform, which would be a perfect waveform. So a nice rule of thumb that came from the HowEquipmentWorks.com website, which is a wonderful resource for this. Say they, their heuristic is when looking at SpO2, C pleth before O2. I would add to this, verify that your heart rate from your pulse ox and from your ECG are identical or nearly identical. Now, erroneous data. How about poor placement of the LEDs? This has become such a commodity, many people don't pay close attention to this. So as an example, this will probably give you a waveform and a number. But the accuracy of the number isn't as reliable because the emitters and the detectors aren't lined up opposite one another. That's why they have the alignment marks on the disposable probe. And so what happens is, is you can pick up what's called an optical shunt where some of your light or your light detection is going through the tip of the finger or even through the air. And when that happens, you tend to read low. I'm not sure how legible this table is. This is an ancient study done in the late 1980s, but what they did was they put 
um, pulse oximeter probes on volunteers and then gradually pulled the probes off a millimeter at a time. And that's the arrow going down on the left-hand side. And what you will see, if you follow any one of these columns down, you will see the numbers read low before you stop getting a number. So that's called the penumbra effect. It's thought to be due to optical shunting. Reminds us that attention to detail with probe placement uh, is valuable and important. Doesn't mean it won't work if it's misapplied. It simply not as, won't work as reliably or as accurately. Uh, there was a recent alert uh, in the last year that came out from the National Health Service in the UK reminding us of the harm from inappropriate placement of pulse oximeter probes. Uh, in this case, they were talking about putting finger probes, uh, probes intended for fingers on ears because they aren't calibrated for that. We've all seen that in the ICU. Uh, we are pleased when they give us numbers in a waveform, but what we may not be aware of is, is that they tend to read high. So 80% in this study uh, from 2007 in respiratory care from Haynes et al., 80% of finger sensors on the ear read at least 3% high. You have to be careful that you're not just hunting to get the highest number when you place a pulse oximeter probe. You're interested in getting the most accurate number. Now, Nail polish. So when I say nail polish, I'm thinking of nail polish and then I'm thinking of artificial materials, acrylics. What happens with nail polish? What do we do about it? Usually nothing. Not much happens and we don't do much about it. And the reason for that is that when you study the effect of nail polish on pulse oximetry, if the light gets through and you get a waveform, the effect is actually remarkably small. So zero effect would be the burgundy line going through the middle of this graph. Uh, and most colors uh, give you an effect that's on the order of 1 or 2% low. Uh, and then if somebody's saturation changes on top of that, you would expect it to simply be low by that same amount. It doesn't become even less accurate. So nail polish is generally well tolerated. Uh, if you have somebody who's unwell and you're wondering is the nail polish number or is the nail polish lowering the number or is it the patient, uh, you can reorient the probe. Uh, for example, look through it sideways. That will make it somewhat better but doesn't completely uh, eliminate the effect of nail polish because of how light gets through the finger. But it's a good workaround. It's also a good workaround for people uh, who have long nails. Uh, you can also go through it perpendicularly. Uh, again, trying to be careful to have the light emitters directly opposite the light detector, the photo detector side of it. Generally, we place the light over the nail and the photo detector over the fleshy part because that way the photo detector is a little bit better protected from ambient light. Uh, speaking of ambient light, Modern hospitals have much more light in them than old hospitals because it's actually a requirement in hospital design now. Here I've got a pulse oximeter probe on a finger that I generally wouldn't recommend, but it's to make the point I can take something that is opaque to light. So it's, it's not a sheet or a towel, but something opaque to light like an alcohol swab cover, which is aluminum foil, and put it around the pulse oximeter probe. And now I've completely shielded it from the ambient light, which would improve the signal to noise ratio. Uh, kids, uh, they tend to move around a lot more than adults. And I think it's helpful to take the probe and to do some kind of securement. It will help eliminate motion and also probe dislodgement or the partial dislodgement that can make it read low. And on the right, I've shown how running it up the hand rather than away from the hand and then using some coban or uh, armband or something else to help secure it will greatly improve the function in kids. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the data. So, so it's important to be reminded that a pulse oximeter gives us continuous data, but, but the data that we get from the pulse oximeter are really about something that happened a while back. They are not real time. 
and they are not real time for a couple of reasons. One is the instrument averages data, so it has a time-weighted average. That average is selectable by you, so it's useful to inform yourself what your clinical circumstance or institutional setting desires, that it's not just the out-of-the-box averaging time. Uh, and it also depends on what sensor location you use. Here's an example of pulling it up on a screen. Uh, in this case, the averaging time is in the fast mode. Uh, some will go as fast as a two-second running average. Others you can run out to several minutes. Uh, again, in a critical care environment, you prefer to be in a faster averaging time rather than in a slower one. So the factory default for most devices is around 10 seconds, which for me is a little bit slow in, in my work as an anesthesiologist, but might be fine in a recovery room or on a ward. Uh, some people run it out longer because as you run it out longer, you eliminate more of the motion issues. They get averaged out. So think about that. It's a choice you can make. The longer the averaging time is, the more you aggravate the impact of where you choose to place your sensor. So let's go into that a little bit. And so data lag. So when I when oxygenation changes, it would first show up at the pulmonary veins and then has to work its way through the heart and then out to where my pulse oximeter is. If it's got to get all the way from the lungs to the foot, that's physically a further distance and therefore a longer time than a sensor put on the hand or the head. Same would be true for a, a site that is cold as compared to one that is warm because it has less blood flow, so there's a bigger lag. A patient coming in and congestive heart failure takes longer to manifest a change, either going down or recovering than somebody that comes in septic with a hyperdynamic circulation. Uh, and then also that's true for the impact of the averaging time. This is a study done in cyanotic children who were in the operating room. So they start out with low saturations and they had a probe across their cheek on a finger and a toe simultaneously. The children were then uh, made apneic and they were observed until the saturation had decreased by uh, I think 3% if memory serves. And what you see is, is that the solid line so bottom left line representing the cheek showed the desaturation earlier than the, than the finger or the toe sensor. The second thing, and I think this is clinically important, is that when ventilation was reinitiated, so that's the dotted orange or red line on your screen, you now look at the pulse oximeter trace and you say, whoa, the saturation continues to go down for some seconds after I start ventilating. That's the lag time between the blood getting from the lungs that are now better oxygenated all the way out to where the sensor is. That lag time, the time where you are aging clinically because you're wondering if you've done the right thing, uh, is shorter for the head sensor, in this case around the cheek, than it was for the finger or the toe sensor. Now, if you're not getting data from a finger, there are a couple of options. I can think of external warming and internal warming. So let's dig into those a little bit. These are photoplethysmographic waveforms at red and infrared wavelengths and the baseline condition is the middle panel on each side, running maybe at a little bit faster sleep speed than we typically run our traces. And what you see is a, a okay, not a particularly good, not an awful waveform. If you take that patient's or that subject's hand and now, now move to the upper panel, that's what happens when that person's holding a, a cold bottle of water or immersed in, in cool water. It almost goes away from the vasoconstriction, whereas conversely in the bottom panel in both of these subjects, you see how much more physiologic the waveform looks when you warm the patient's hand up with a warm water bottle. 
So temperature is very helpful. So if you have cold pads, anything you can do to warm the site uh, will help improve the signal. And if the signal is bigger, then the data you get from it become more accurate. Now, you can also do a digital nerve block. And you're thinking to yourself, digital nerve block? So this is plain lidocaine, half a cc, at the web space on each side of the finger with a pulse ox probe. So pulse ox probe is on the middle finger, again, the best finger. And the left-hand side is the temperature pre-block, so roughly 23, 24, 24, 22 degrees. Ten minutes later, you go, oh, these fingers warmed up by four or five degrees. There must be more blood flowing there, otherwise the finger wouldn't warm up. More blood flow, bigger signal, now I get data. Uh, if you look at the adjacent finger, so those are the two right-hand columns, you see there is no impact on their temperature. So digital nerve block works. You wouldn't do this in somebody who is anticoagulated. You have to be careful to not stick yourself when you're doing it. Plain lidocaine, half cc, each side at the base of the finger. I've got a couple of anatomy pictures here. So this is a superficial dissection of the palm. And you see there are lots of nerves in there that run uh, towards your fingertips, kind of, if you look at your fingers head on, they would be at kind of the five o'clock and the seven o'clock position in relation uh, to the bones of the fingers. So those are the nerves. And a little bit deeper, those are the blood vessels. So when you do a digital block, you are blocking the nerves that supply, that initiate the vasoconstriction to the blood vessels, the so-called nervovasorum. Now, another thing that happens in hard-to-monitor patients is say, you know, I don't want to do a nerve block. Um, I can't warm my patient up anymore. There's simply not enough blood flow. And I use another site like the head. And so the ear, with the caveats we spoke about before, uh, about it not being calibrated for that, there are forehead sensors, and there's even now a nasal ALA sensor. So... This is a picture of an infrared, uh, I'm sorry, an infrared image of a person who just stepped into a cold room. Uh, and what you see is, is the hands are warm, the face is warm, the hair and the clothing are nearer room temperature. So in the 20 degree range, uh, the redder you are, the warmer you are, obviously well perfused. And say, so, okay, so finger sensor would work here. Uh, let me just go back one, and you can see a forehead sensor would also work because the forehead is fairly red, thus fairly warm. Now, forehead sensors, if you use one, think about where the vasculature is. So it runs the supraorbital artery. It's generally right in line with the pupil, so that would be where you would stick your probe, not medial or lateral to that. And what they found in this study was that the forehead sensor and the finger sensor uh, upper left-hand graph respond very similarly in timeline to a desaturation event. If blood flow to the arm is inhibited a little bit, in this case, they put a tennis ball in the uh, volunteer's axilla, you can see that the forehead sensor uh, is faster in its response than the finger sensor. So that's useful. It, it makes sense in terms of being closer to the heart uh, and of having a pretty good blood supply. Now, if you take somebody and you vasoconstrict them more, so in this case, they're in, in a cold room for 45 minutes, you look at the left-hand panel and you say, yes, that's just stepped into the room in the right-hand panel, and you notice how the fingers and hands turn distinctly room colorish in this uh, infrared temperature scale, uh, as does the tip of the nose. So more support for using a uh, forehead sensor. If you look at the size of the signal uh, and you look at uh, tall left-hand bar would be baseline in a warm room, so 23 degrees or 74 degrees Fahrenheit, and what happens with a cold room, you see how the fingers vasoconstrict, the amplitude of the pulse waveform gets much smaller. 
the middle pair is what happens from an ear. So you see the ear signal starts smaller than the finger and also gets smaller with cold. Forehead sensor starts with sort of an intermediate amplitude and doesn't change much with temperature. Frostbite. If you think about blood flow, think about frostbite, right? So fingertips, toes, and ears. That's where it happens. Now, if you have a probe on somebody and the probe is applied and illuminated, that's a good sign. If the temperature of the site isn't cool to the touch, that's a good sign. If you're still not getting data, try and improve the signal-to-noise ratio by using some kind of, kind of an opaque light shield. The other source of available uh, foil, which is opaque to red and infrared light, would be the packets that the ECG pads come in because those are foil packets. And lastly, if you're not getting any data and wonder, could it be the device, you can always check it on yourself. Now, if you get your ICU patient and you're having trouble getting data and you were on vasopressors, and in this study, this is uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine at at least 0.1 mics per kilo per minute, so impressive uh, uh, doses of vasoconstrictor, and you look at what happens at finger and forehead sensors. So, so the bottom line, four of the 140 finger sensors didn't work in this setting. Uh, all the forehead sensors worked. But also significant here is outliers. So an outlier is somebody where you get a signal, you get a number, but the number disagrees with what you get from a blood gas. So SpO2 is at least 3% difference or more than SaO2, and you see that a third of the finger sensors were off by more than 3%, and 15% of the forehead sensors were off. So, so be wary of that. Now, what about the nose? Well, the nose is accessible, uh, certainly. The nose is interesting because it's very vascular, as you might have seen in somebody who has a nosebleed. The nose blood supply we maybe haven't thought about much, but it comes from a branch of the internal carotid artery and another branch from the external carotid artery. And like the forehead, there isn't any motion of the nose unless you're about to sneeze. So the dominant supply to the nose kind of comes up in the nasolabial grooves from the bottom. That's a branch of the facial artery, which comes off the carotid. And you have another branch that comes from the internal carotid via one of the infraorbital arteries. And they sort of meet kind of right where the edge of your nostril meets your cheek. So that's looking like it might be a decent signal. This is an image that I got recently of somebody who injected a plasticizing material into a cadaver. And if you look at this picture carefully, you get a sense that directly opposite the arrow that I've placed on the picture is the nose. And you see how densely vascularized it is. Uh, the, this is a, this uh, image is facing roughly right as you look at it, 45 degrees. So there's a tremendous amount of blood supply to the face. Now, if I say, okay, if I put a pulse oximeter probe on the nose, is it accurate? And the left-hand panel shows it has uh, low bias and high precision of, over all the saturations we think of between 70 and 100%. And then you say, okay, what does this look like in real life? I would now point you to the right-hand side of, of this. And what you have is the heart rate in green at the bottom and pulse oximetry in the blue at the top. So this is a desaturation experiment. And you see as the saturation goes down, the heart rates or the subject's heart rate goes up. And then when and then in the middle of that graph, as the saturation recovers with reoxygenation, the subject breathes a sigh of relief, heart rate goes down until it's done again. Hiding inside 
the blue uh, line at the top of all these saturation points are little uh, sort of brownish orange dots that reflect uh, blood gases done at the same time, and you see that you have this very good correlation uh, with the nasal ALAR pulse oximeter probe. Now, nasal, so, so the nose is actually a region. It's not a spot. And so if you are going to use one of these probes, you want it slid posteriorly all the way up against the cheek rather than out near the tip. Uh, so just like with a finger probe, you want to think about where and how you apply it. And the reason for that is, 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 is the circulation at the tip of the nose isn't as good as it is at the base of the nose. This is an image of a person with frostbite I got off of the internet that very nicely shows the vulnerability of the, of the tip of the nose. The other thing that happens at the nose is, is it's, there not, doesn't seem to be as rich an alpha receptor innovation at the nose as there is at the finger. So if you just look at the size of the pleth from the nose, again, up against the cheek, in the top graph, the blue one, you see it's small. You have one from the finger uh, in the bottom graph in green. And then where it says IV bolus on this screen, the uh, subject is given neosinephrine, so pure alpha agonist. And what you see is, is that as it circulates to the finger, roughly uh, half a minute later, the finger pleth goes away, while the nasal alar pleth actually got bigger because the blood pressure went up. So a nice demonstration of the different innervation between the nose and an extremity. Now, what about forehead versus ALA in critically ill patients? So this is a group of patients that were on one or more pressors. Most of them were on two. They had incredibly high Apache scores, averaging 35, and uh, high doses of norepinephrine, epinephrine, and basal. Some were actually on, on all three. And so what this slide is showing, this comes from uh, Barnes Hospital, uh, Wash U. Uh, no data in the fingers in 98% of patients, no data from the forehead in roughly one-fifth of patients, and no data from the ALA in about 6% of patients. So it seems to be a somewhat more protected site in these very ill patients. If you look at the accuracy, remember, as the signal gets weaker, we tend to, we become vulnerable to the data be, being more different from what you would get from a blood gas saturation. So what I've outlined with this uh, central panel that I've put a box around is if you look at the percent that are within 3% of a blood gas from the forehead or from the nose, you see that at the time of enrollment in these critically ill patients, roughly a quarter of the forehead sensors were within 3%, whereas half of the nasal ALA sensors were, were within 3%. Um, a day later, the patients had improved and both sensors and both um, categories where they couldn't obtain a signal uh, was also uh, better. Now, what's different about an ALAR sensor from a finger sensor? It's actually the same technology as the finger probe, and, and based on their calibrations, it's the same algorithm. It's even the same waveform. But what you get on average is a bigger signal-to-noise ratio in the same way that you get a bigger signal-to-noise ratio from a middle finger than you do from a little finger or a thumb, you get an even bigger signal from the ALA up against the cheek. So what's different? Well, the location is different, and it's a self-retaining clip uh, rather than an adhesive. So if I remind, if I can remind you again, if you're going to use one of these sensors, slide it posteriorly, and then just like you would with a forehead sensor, check it or rotate the site based on the uh, manufacturer's recommendations so that you don't end uh, get a uh, make your patient vulnerable to a pressure injury. <laughs>
Now, when pressure injuries have happened, uh, you see that with both forehead and ALAR sensors, there are a few reported. Uh, in this case, monitoring for 50 or 60 hours, you had uh, about 13 forehead skin injuries and about three ALAR injuries. So it is possible with both, although it seems to be a little bit less common with the uh, ALAR sensor. Now, potential benefits of monitoring here. I mentioned earlier that you have a bigger signal. If you have a bigger signal, you will be alerted sooner to the fact that things are in decline. And when you intervene, you will be reassured quicker that your intervention is working or alerted earlier to the fact that it's not working and that it works better in low peripheral perfusion states than a finger sensor. And to do that, I'm and going to we run know this that demo. it's a further distance from the heart to the fingertip than it is from the heart to the head, where a nasal ALAR sensor would be. What I would like to do now is to do a demonstration of breath holding. I'm actually going to exhale and then exhale further to get down to what's referred to as expiratory reserve volume. That causes a shunt, so mixed venous blood comes across very quickly and I can desaturate in less than a minute. Then I will take a breath. It will be obvious when I take a breath, and, and you will then see on the screen both my digitally derived uh, saturation and the nasal ALAR derived saturation. When the concept of an ALAR sensor is new to you. So a, a couple of points here. I don't know if you were able to notice how much bigger the signal was from my nasal sensor than it was from my finger sensor. We got the apnea alarm that came early. Uh, and then we had a decline in the nasal saturation that preceded the decline in the finger uh, sensor. And when I began to breathe again, the nasal ALAR sensor responded much faster than the finger sensor. Um, sorry about the wheeze there. I didn't know I had that until I did that. So talk about hard to monitor patients. What about the VAD patient, the ventricular assist device patient who doesn't have a pulse? One option to consider there is a cerebral oximeter. So that's a reflectance technology. It has different normal values, but doesn't require a pulse. The thing to keep in mind, there are things besides oxygenation that will change your cerebral saturation because it's kind of a mixed value, and those would include a change in blood pressure, a change in hematocrit, and also a change in carbon dioxide, right? Because when you hyperventilate, you get cerebral vasoconstriction, and when you hypoventilate, you get cerebral vasodilation. Um, so what do we know about the most ill? as we wrap this thing up. We know it can be difficult to monitor. We know that central sites are generally less likely to fail. We know that if we, if we have a 
pure, uh, poor waveform, we should be reminded that it's worth checking an SAO2 from a blood gas to verify that your SPO2 from the pulse oximeter is representative, especially when the perfusion index or signal strength uh, value is low or the waveform is low or small in cases where you don't have a actual value for the size of the signal. And in cases where the heart rate from the ECG and the pulse oximeter um, are not congruent. Uh, rotate your sensor sites because the reason you can't monitor from the fingers is because the perfusion is compromised. And then lastly, if you don't have a pulse in a patient who is otherwise alive, a cerebral saturation monitor is an option, but it's different numbers and there are also other things that impact on it. So I hope that I've given you some Heimlich equivalents for how to think about your pulse oximeter and to make pulse oximetry failures less likely. This is one of my favorite Larson cartoons where Zeke uses the famous Rex maneuver when I guess uh, Rex got uh, choked up on this cat. Um, a nice source, if you want to share any of this with uh, colleagues, is this How Equipment Works Pulse Oximeter website, uh, where they, they do a nice job of explaining many of these concepts. Um, I'd like to turn this back over to Dr. Burkow, our moderator, because that concludes my uh, prepared remarks. Uh, Dr. Burkow? Thank you very much, Dr. Gravenstein, for a very enlightening presentation. Before we start our question and answer session, I have a few reminders for the audience. Once again, this educational activity is approved for one contact hour. After the presentation is done, you can get CE credits by going to the website saxtesting.com slash bow. You will need to register at this site. So after you register, you'll complete the evaluation, and upon successful completion, you'll be able to print your certificate of completion. And again, support for this educational activity has been provided by Phillips. This presentation was recorded, so an archive on-demand version will be available after the webinar at betteroutcomes.org, and you'll receive an email about when this archive version is available. And the on-demand version is also accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists. Now I'm going to turn it over to Joe to give you some brief instructions about how to use the Q and answer uh, part. Joe? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for questions. If you would like to submit a question, please utilize the Q&A function on the right side of your page. Please note there will be a survey at the end of today's presentation. Please do not close your browser, as your browser will be automatically redirected to the survey. Again, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please utilize the Q&A function on the right side of your page. All right. We received lots of very interesting questions. So the first question is, can you talk about how important it is that you place the light of the probe over the nail bed? Uh, certainly. So the light doesn't have to be over the nail bed. But if you if you think about the light being over the nail bed as opposed to the photo detector being over the nail bed, uh, when the photo detector is over the nail bed, what happens is, is it's easy for ambient light to get in, and that simply changes the signal-to-noise ratio a little bit because it dilutes it some. Uh, whereas if the light detector, in other words, the non-illuminated part, of the pulse oximeter probe. If it's against the fleshy part of the finger, the finger tends to sort of push around it a little bit and helps shield it. That's the only reason for that. It will work in both ways, but when you have somebody who's hard to monitor, I think that's one of the little details uh, that can help you. Thank you. Uh, there was also a question related to this about what effect does skin pigmentation have on the pulse oximetry? And will you have an error if you have people with dark skin, say, if you put it on the ear? So, so people have studied that, and there is a tendency for people with pigmented skin to, on average, be a little bit lower, not clinically important lower, but they might be lower by a point or two, independent of uh, where on the body you look at them. 
because the skin pigment is everywhere. The same thing has been described for people in liver failure who are hyperbilirubinemic. But I think of that as a fixed offset. So if the saturation changes in either direction from their baseline, the change will still be reflected. So if you're off by a, I'm, I'm sorry. So sorry. I can say. So if you're off, if if you are off by a point or two, you are off by a fixed amount that is constant. Another participant wanted to know if it matters whether you put the probe on the left versus the right hand. So you would expect the saturation to be identical from both hands and, and all fingers. And, and when we say identical, by that we mean within 2%, because plus or minus 2% is the stated accuracy, I think, of, of all pulse oximeters on the hand. Uh, I tend to put it in the hand with, with the IV, if I know where the IV is going to be or if one is in place uh, because that's least likely to move. Uh, some people like to put it on the non-dominant hand simply because there is less motion there on average in somebody who is awake and able to move. In a patient who is sedated or unconscious, uh, there's no difference. Uh, some people like to put it on the same arm with the blood pressure cuff so you can periodically validate your blood pressure, loss of flow, return to flow by looking at where the left waveform goes away and compare that to an art line uh, value uh, or for for a different site. So it, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, but but beyond that, there's no special reason to use one hand over the other. Thank you. We've had a couple questions about uh, nail polish and acrylic nails and uh, whether you can how the Turning the probe sideways may help get a better reading and also maybe not damage their manicure. So, so when pulse oximetry first came out, uh, it was pretty common for everybody to be asked to remove their nail polish from one finger. Uh, and, and then I forget who it was who first did it, but this has been studied several times now. And because the effect is so small, we don't bother uh, doing that anymore. If you have somebody who's got an unusually long nail, either natural or acrylic, um, they're invested in that. It's, it would be patient-centered care to say, let's figure out how to get this value from your finger without having to disturb you know, the energy you've invested in your nail. And so then you can go around them uh, sideways or perpendicularly. They all work. There is maybe still a small effect from the color because the light doesn't go through the finger as a straight line. It sort of volume conducts and bounces around the bone. Uh, so there may be a tiny effect. But again, it's not clinically important. There are some nail polishes that are so opaque that nothing gets through, so you have to go through the finger sideways. But that's unusual. Okay, we have a couple questions about alternate sites. Uh, so one question is, can you use a disposable finger probe on the forehead? The answer to that is you can, but you shouldn't. And the, and the reason for that is, is that the, the one forehead sensor that I'm aware of on the market is specifically calibrated for that. And it, it even comes with a special head strap that you use to get rid of the venous contamination. Remember that with the forehead sensor, the, the designed forehead sensor uses a different approach. Instead of looking at how much goes through the tissue, it is looking at how much reflects. So one is reflectance, the typical some transmits through something, some of which is absorbed. So you can put a finger sensor up there and you can get a number, but you shouldn't rely on it it's not calibrated for that. And you're interested not in not in getting a number, but you're interested in getting an accurate number. So I, I would discourage that. And we cringe when we see that. Uh, so, so that's my end. And, and, and I, I'm also, I, I have not seen it formally studied. It would actually something we should probably do. Uh, but it is also in keeping with the warning from the National Health Service that, that talks about their concern about uh, finger, uh, finger 
sensors that are placed in other locations. Remember, when finger sensors were originally calibrated, it was, it was calibrated specifically for that location and, and with the light going through a finger with the tissue and the bone in it. it. That has not been done for the finger. There are some special ear sensors that have been calibrated for the ear. But otherwise, using finger sensors in other locations can and usually will give you a waveform, but it doesn't give you the accuracy your patients deserve. So also related to ear probes, we have a couple questions about them. One person asked if it's okay to use it on the nose, and another person asked about where's the best place on the ear to place the ear probe. So, so let, let, me, let me talk about ear probe on the nose. <clears throat> um, I, I suppose you could do that. It, it hasn't been studied. I don't know what the pressure from the clip is, uh, and I don't know how deep into the nose that would go. I mean, that's the beauty of having something that was specifically designed for that. Uh, you, you wouldn't know without calibrating it. In, in terms of the ear, the difficulty with ear sensors is, is, is we don't all have the same ear shape. So you can, you can apply something to the ear. Generally, it's on the hanging part of the ear. I, I, I would say where you put an ear ring, but now where people put piercings in their ear, that's not specific anymore. So it's the, it's the part of your ear nearest the shoulder. Uh, that way you're not pushing on cartilage. Uh, so someone yeah. else would like to know, yes, what type of pressure sores have been seen with the nasal probes, if you know? So I have a little bit of information about that, not comprehensive information. Uh, I mean, there have been hundreds of thousands of applications. There have not been very many injuries, I, th I think, but I don't know that it's when the probes are out near the tip uh, there's an advisory either with the package or with the manufacturer about uh, site inspection and rotation in the same way there is with the forehead sensor. It, you you have just have to be careful with the really sick patients because the reason you're doing this is because their circulation isn't normal anyways. And even though you can still get data from the nasal ala or the forehead, it is not normally perfused in those patients. It is the perfusion is also affected. It's simply not as affected. Yes, and the manufacturer actually recommends it for the ALR probe that you rotate the site every eight hours and as often as every four hours if you do have a critically ill patient that you think would be at higher risk. Yeah, if if I if I can just just jump in there. So that's roughly a, a once a shift event. Uh, you, you simply, when you do it, you simply go to the other side. Uh, and it's an easy, easy thing to do because it's a self-retaining clip. So it's not like rotating a finger sensor uh, that's disposable where you have to peel off the adhesive. And, and you can do this for days. Yes. And, uh, Someone also asked, and yes, the ALR sensors plug into all the different vendors' pulse oximetry cords, so it works with whatever vendor you use to monitor pulse oximetry. Uh, it's right. certainly worked. It's it's worked with all those I've used. I don't know if there are any that it is not calibrated for. I'm I'm unaware of that. But I would ask the manufacturer about that. This is an interesting question. Um, someone asked, what about infant and toddler probe placement for home use? So I assume if they're, they're home with apnea monitoring. So, so in, in that case, I think of where I have stability. So in, in infants that young, I think of across the foot with a sock over it. So I have a little bit of protection from ambient light, not perfect protection, but a little bit, and the sock helps stabilize it over the foot, and generally feet move uh, less than hands do. And, and in that case, the infant probes seem to work very nicely around uh, the distal part of the foot. 
Great. Thank you. Now, unfortunately, that's all the time we have, so I thank everyone who posted questions, and I apologize we couldn't get to everyone's questions. And I'm going to turn it back to Joe for some concluding remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's webinar. Please note there will be a survey following the conclusion. Please do not close your browser. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and have a wonderful day.